Welcome to Everything Life Coaching. I'm John Kim. And I'm Noelle Cordo. We are the founders of Journey Coaching. We're super passionate about all things coaching and want to share what we've learned from over a decade of coaching and training over a thousand life coaches. Dive deep into a more meaningful career, find freedom, and make an impact on the world around you. Noelle and I are going to talk to you today about the science of of practicing gratitude. Noelle. Hello. Hello. I have a story that I want to share with everyone. Oh, wonderful. Yes. So Noelle does these things called gratitude bombs and she's been doing them forever. And they're basically emails that she sends out to people. Um, and I don't know, do you do it annually or is it whenever you feel? Whenever I feel. And I try, I usually do it around this time of year. Yes. And so I got one from her and it kind of made me want to like pay it forward and and also, you know, do it myself. And I wanted to play with uh, what it would be like to um, spread gratitude in that format. So I got to say, you know, I sat down this morning and I sent one to uh, my agent. I sent one to my publisher. I sent one to friends. It's like it becomes contagious because you start thinking about all the, the people in your life and what you're grateful for. And what was really valuable for me uh, was like, you know, you could say I'm grateful for that tree outside, but if you actually put it into an email, you have to start talking about why. And you start thinking about, uh, it just goes deeper. So it's not just a checklist, but it kind of connects you to the process and the experience of practicing gratitude instead of just, uh, you know, it becoming a routine where you're marking off boxes. Oh my goodness. That's first of all, beautiful. Thank you for the shout out on the gratitude bombs. And there was so much good stuff in what you just described. Mm. And for me, the most important part of it were two words, contagion and connection. Oh, interesting. I love that I just throw something out there and then and then you you break it down with science because oh, that's that's what makes this podcast. <laughs> chocolate and peanut butter. <laughs> yeah. So contagion go uh, contagion and what else? And connection. Mm. Yeah. So when we're talking about gratitude and what it does for our brain and our body, we have to take into account the fact that it, it, gratitude and a gratitude practice, exactly as you described, allows us to connect to ourselves, to others, to nature, to the universe, to our spiritual side in a deeper and more meaningful way so that we really internalize the health benefits of inducing those positive emotions. And the contagion piece is really foundational to the science of social contagion. You're more likely to adopt the habits and patterns of people around you. So by you picking up the gratitude bomb because it feels good and then, you know, firing that out to a bunch of people, you are tipping the dominoes towards social contagion where others will begin to have that exact same compassionate response. Yeah, I felt that. I felt that um, when you start thinking about what you're grateful uh, for, uh, you know, with one person or one relationship or or one thing in your life, uh, it can start to have a ripple effect where, you know, it becomes, you start thinking about more. They're like little links in a chain. Mm -hmm. Very much so. And another thing that you said was really getting specific with what you're grateful for and really getting specific in the act of thanking people the it, it's too surface to just say oh you know i'm thankful for the sunshine um i noel i'm thankful for the sunshine on this november day that you know breaks through the gray clouds and makes the yellow leaves sparkle that's very different right and also you know why you're thankful for the sh- sunshine can make it also deeper and stretch absolutely absolutely so let's talk about why this kind of work is important and why we talk about it pretty consistently um, in our shop. I think number one, it's really part of the culture of what we do at Journey Coaching is being grateful for, for others and how they show up in the world. And beyond that, the act of inducing positive emotions has real tangible health benefits. Yes, let's talk about them. 
So, so I think, a, well, a lot of people just think, gra- you know, a lot of people think gratitude is for someone else. They don't realize it's for them. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's 100% for the self. And, you know, when you experience stress and anxiety, that has a, a negative cardiovascular impact on your body. And when you induce positive emotions with something like a gratitude practice, you actually began to repair that cardiovascular damage and that stress response. Oh, I like the word repair. Yeah, it's true. And and on top of that, you also um, begin to build um, kind of a force field of resiliency in your brain where you tend to pick up on more optimist driven um, nuances in life. And with consistent practice, you actually can change your brain chemistry from pessimistic to optimistic. Yes. And I, and I think um, it's easier said than done. And I think that uh, uh, most people, they kind of default to the glass is half empty, um, you know, uh, just because life is hard and, and there are obstacles and there are things that we've been through. Um, but gratitude is just a really simple and powerful way to start uh, rewiring yourself, correct? Oh, very much so. And one of the outcomes that I discovered that I thought of with you is uh, gratitude practice directly leads to better sleep. Mm, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So talk about your gratitude journey. How has it shown up for you in your life? How have you come to experience it now? And where do you think you want to go? I, th- I I believe that there's there are two musts in in life, and I think you know one must is um, to always want want more or better or different, and it doesn't matter if we're talking about your relationships or building a business or your creativity uh, that keeps people uh, unstagnant and unstuck, and we are evolving and growing and stretching. But I think the other must is getting to a place where you are really happy and appreciative of what you have right now in your life today, not yesterday, not what you had or not what you're going to have, but like today in this moment. And I think that's the harder, harder, harder piece. And I think that's what, I mean, that's what I've been struggling with. And I think without that piece, you're not grounded. And I think this is the value of gratitude is, you know, in my twenties and thirties, I I never practiced gratitude. Um, I always saw my life as half empty, incomplete uh, chasing, which then creates a line of desperation. And uh, I I was never able to be present. Um, But I think what gratitude does is it, it gets you to be more present because you, you have that other must that I was talking about, or you build it, which is uh, to be happy with what you have today. Yes. Incredible. And let's add to that. What happens for you physiologically when you're in um a negative state when you're in your limbic brain in a negative format your eyes narrow you take in less color and your senses are less activated when you are engaged in either your prefrontal cortex or a positive limbic state your senses expand, your eyes widen, your pupils dilate, you're able to physically take in more color, sight, sound, senses, smell, and and really truly live and engage in the world in terms of all of its flavors. Yeah, that's so true. You almost go from black and white to color. Yes. That's a great descriptor. That's a, a that's a fantastic descriptor for how this works. So guys, if you're if you're listening to us and saying, "Oh, you know, this is really fluffy." It's not. You're going to repair cardiovascular damage to your heart and you're going to begin engaging with your senses in a way that allows you to actually experience living. You know what I find the most challenging about gratitude and it's like meditation, um I could do it once or twice or, or for that week. But what happens is as life happens, you, you forget about it, you know? So like, how do, how do people thread this into their life? So it's a constant practice and it's not just something you do on, you know, Thanksgiving. Just as I mentioned with social contagion, you know, other people matter big time. And so threading this into the culture of your home life, um, your friend life, and your job life is really important to kind of solidify the practice. That's the reason that we open our team meetings with gratitudes. Yeah, it's almost like a way of living. 
It is a way of living. And when you work, especially at home with the people in your family that you share your home with to get specific about things that you're grateful for day in and day out, it sets the conversational tone for the evening. It sets the emotional tone for the evening. And it really um, gives your home environment a, a kind of a boost. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I think, um, I, and, and you know, gratitude has just become such a big word these days. Uh, but, I, but I still think, and you know, I struggle with it myself, there's a difference between um, it being on the forefront of your mind or on a checklist. Um, and again, what we're talking about now, uh, actually to live it, to turn it into a lifestyle. Uh, and I think that's where you'll see the benefits. Uh, and I think like meditation, a lot of people kind of flirt with it, and then they don't see the benefits, and then they just don't do it anymore. Yeah. So let's talk about why um, you and probably many others are so resistant to this practice. I think a lot of it. Oh, go ahead. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, well, I was going to say first, um, I don't know what word you used. You said uh, fluffy. I think you said fluffy, which is hilarious because that's how I saw it. I saw gratitude as a cloud, as woo woo, as kind of like, you know, um, something you do if you have time. I saw it as a bumper sticker. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it, and and I think that that um, that tendency to minimize these practices, to push them away, um, they're not you know material, they're not impactful, um, and also I think a lot of it has to do with um, the self that a lot of people believe that self appreciation enacting gratitude, taking time for the self to appreciate, you know, who they are in context is selfish or self-centered. And so those feelings of discomfort are what cause the resistance. I also think many of us uh, grow up uh, wired and trained to and conditioned to take care of other people. You know, yes. I think we forget about ourselves. So then later in life to practice gratitude is challenging because we're so used to um, not thinking about ourselves and, and, you know, anything that has to do with us, we're more um, used to putting other people before us and taking care of someone else. Yes. And even in the context of our discussion today, we talked about every aspect of gratitude that is external. We didn't at all talk about appreciating personal strengths, personal accomplishments and, you know, being grateful for what we ourselves do to create goodness in the world. Yes. And I want to insert one of the things that, that I think we don't think about when we think about gratitude is how far we've come, meaning mm. our story. You know, it's easy to look outside and be grateful for the sun and for, you know, the coffee in your hand and all of that. But um, when it comes to our stories, most of us, we, 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 you know, because they're lined with shame and, and all the stuff that we didn't want to happen. Uh, it's very hard to get to a place where you are grateful for all the, you know, transitions and the pain and the rebirth and all of that. But I think that that can be really powerful. And I think it, there's also, you know, social conditioning um, in different cultural aspects and different gendered aspects to not brag, to not take up space, to not stand, you know, on our own accomplishments. I know for me, that has been an extraordinary journey of moving from feeling like I couldn't take up space in the world, you know, literally as an anorexic to, you know, getting to a point in life where I am proud, confident, and really excited about owning the work that I do. Yeah. How do you know the difference or when you are, um, you know, when it's coming from kind of a, an arrogant ego place or if it's coming from a self-love place? Well, I think that's tricky with ego work. You know, our, there it's, it's it's like anything, you know, one piece of cake on your birthday is great. <laughs> but if you just <laughs> right. if, eat if the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. It it gets to be a little bit much. So, you know, um an internal check on, you know, just like we teach in the catalyst intensive, when you want to share something about yourself, who is it for and what's the outcome? And, you know, if, if I'm sharing something about myself, if I'm sharing knowledge, if I'm sharing credentials, if I'm sharing um, outcomes, am I doing it, 
you know, because my own ego needs validation or am I doing it as steward of our company, steward of myself to move the ball further down the field? So how do you practice gratitude when it comes to self? How do you practice um, being grateful for yourself and your story or what you've done or what you've accomplished? So this work is really fascinating. It comes from the work of Kristen Neff, who is one of my favorite uh, researchers on self-compassion. And she says that step one is really the act of noticing and accepting our flaws and accepting our inadequacies. And that can be foundational to practice and develop self-appreciation. So you're talking about self-compassion. You're talking about um, not rejecting parts of us that we don't like, but actually um, throwing love at those parts and accepting those parts. Throwing, yeah, uh, there are three components. It's self-kindness, recognizing common humanity, and then mindfulness. So if we're taking each of those pieces, you know, self-kindness is, is softening and saying, I have flaws, I have inadequacies, and I am whole and deserving of loving kindness anyway. The humanity piece, I think, is truly the most powerful part of this. And it's the understanding that every single one of us is flawed with inadequacies. All of us. And we all struggle to hide our inadequacies and we all struggle to, you know, keep them in the dark it, it, instead of ask for help, essentially. Well, so knowing that others are struggling with this too uh, makes you feel less alone and makes you feel, uh, it normalizes you. It normalizes you. And in a moment of suffering, you can connect to all of humanity. And, and understand that what you are going through is part of a universal experience of being human. Yeah, going from the I to we, mm -hmm. that makes it really powerful. Yeah, and then mindfulness brings it all home with really just, as we were talking about before, um, dropping down, being present, and then turning the dial to begin expressing appreciation for our good qualities, just as we would with a friend. Yeah, it's one of those things that they say, which can be difficult, is uh, to treat yourself as you would, you know, a good friend or someone that you really love and, and respect and appreciate, which is hard to do. That's really hard to do. And, and I want to talk about that for a little bit because it's really layered. It's really, really, really layered. I have been having conversations with a lot of my um, female identifying friends um, around what it means to, as a woman, say, hey, guess what? I'm not going to be responsible for somebody else's happiness. I'm just going to be responsible for my own. How does that land for you to say, you know, John, I just want you to be responsible for your own happiness and nobody else's. Do you think it's true or possible? Uh, I think it's hard. I think, um, I mean, I, I think it's true because I don't, I, I mean, I mean, to be responsible for someone else's happiness is like, I don't even know if that's possible because, you know, because um, you, you can't give someone happy, you know, they, it's, I feel like they have to, they have to build that or, or discover that uh, that's a journey that they have to go on. Um, what I struggle with is in relationships, intimate relationships uh, to not be responsible for someone else's happiness, you know, and, and then when someone's not happy, how that affects you. And then, you know, people are then suddenly are taking each other hostage because of their unhappiness. I think that's, 100% universal in modern times. And I think that the reason we fight so hard with this concept within intimate relationships, um, and that is the number one thing that torpedoes our happiness, let's be honest, um, is uh, the cultural and societal focus on the binary. That is, you know, whether uh, no matter how you identify it, that the primary couple is two people, and that is the be all end all where humans used to live in tribal systems where everybody had different roles. Yeah, so it's like this idea of not 
just putting two people in the pressure cooker, like the, the, then there's less weight on each other. And, and you're talking about um, finding happy uh, as a tribe, right? Uh, spreading it out to friends and, and networks and other parts of your life. So everything is just dependent on your partner or yes. vice versa. Uh, yes. And the recognition that that the pressure for everything to be focused on the singular partner is too much for anyone. Yes, I mean, in that in my world, that's called enmeshment and codependency. Yes. Yeah. And it, it feels amazing, but but you're you're setting yourself up for a fall because, you know, now there's no boundaries and it's two people kind of becoming one. Yes. And in in many ways, enmeshment and codependency can be blockers for presence and gratitude. Oh, absolutely. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're in a relationship where there's a lot of enmeshment and codependency and control and jealousy and all that, that actually can prevent you from practicing gratitude and self-compassion, everything we're talking about. It could. It could. And so for those of you guys who are listening, what, what I'm thinking about is the martyrdom aspect of codependency, um, where you have a hard time attaching to what you as an individual want in life and will martyr your needs for someone else. So if someone's experiencing that, what do you think uh, would be like a first step they can do? Awareness is the key to everything, you know. And and it, I think it's it's not just a simple one two three process. I think it's it's the the act of noticing. Okay, I'm having a really hard time attaching to being present. I'm having a hard time attaching to pleasure and gratitude in my life, um, and I don't like the way that I feel. And once you get to the point of I don't like the way that I feel, that's when the examination begins of what's in this bucket. Yeah, I blood. like where. I, I like where we're going with this because it's it's something that a lot of people don't talk about, which is you know some of the stuff that could be happening underneath that's preventing you from practicing gratitude. Yes, or being being in that state, uh, you know. Yes, and I think this is a really great um, time to introduce the thing that I was most excited about bringing to our listeners today, which is the Nikon reflection. Yes, this is this sounds. I mean, I've never heard of this, and this actually is uh, this is really interesting. Yeah. So, you know, gratitude, as you said, is really commercial at this point. It's fluffy. And when I was doing this research, I discovered just there's such a beautiful world out there of, of work around this. So Nikon therapy is a structured method of self-reflection that was developed in Japan in the 1940s by a Buddhist minister. So literally translated, it means looking within. And this is something that, yes, was established with Buddhist tenets, but regardless of religious re belief or affiliation, you know, this is for you. So the questions are that you you think about the specific people in your life. And so following um, Thanksgiving, going into the holiday run, this is a really great time to drop down and work on this in terms of your family and in terms of the people in your life. So um, number one, let's say, you know, um, I'm going to take my mom as somebody that I want to focus on and I'm going to think about a specific time in my life. So say when I was a baby, zero to six years old, and I'm going to contemplate what did my mom give to me from zero to six years old? What did I return to this person? What did I return to my mother in terms of giving? And then the third piece, which was super interesting to me, is what trouble did I cause this person? And that last question really fleshes it out from the perspective of engaging with humility. Yes, I think I think we should all you have to be careful with that question too because you could also drop into a place of shame. <laughs> yes. You know? It's true. It's true. So if I'm if I'm really going there and I'm I'm saying, you know, okay, um what did the, my mom give to me? She kept me alive. She provided me with, you know, shelter, love, care. She stopped work, she took care of me, she played with me. Um she loved me. What did I return to her? just from looking at pictures of myself when I was a kid, I know that 
she experienced great joy that she had this little baby, um, you know, who was wonderful and cute. And so I brought her, you know, great joy. And then, you know, what trouble did I cause my mom during that period of time? I know it was lonely. I know she was home by herself. I know that um, my dad was at first kind of resentful that he had to be the the sole breadwinner because she wanted to stay home. And so there was trouble caused by me. I don't feel shame around it because I was a baby, um, but it really puts my mom's humanity in perspective for me. And I'm able to open now and attach to her with just a, a, a really profound sense of gratitude much deeper than before I started this exercise. Right. The point of question three, what trouble did I cause this person isn't for you to internalize or, you know, blame yourself, but it's more so to deploy empathy and see what the other person uh, went through. So that yes. you value them, right? Yes. So reflecting on the three themes, what did this person give me? What did I return to this person? And what trouble did I cause this person is a way of reflecting on personal relationships that helps you cultivate feelings of gratitude and appreciation while also expanding awareness of the moral relationship with others in terms of giving, receiving, and hurting. Yeah, as you, as you were doing this for yourself, I was thinking about um, my dad. Mm -hmm. And if I was to do it for me, uh, what I received – what did I receive? So, so step one is no. What what, what did this person give me? What did your dad and, give you? Yeah, yeah, and that to me, that's just him being the first to kind of come to America. So, giving me um, education, well, giving me America, <laughs> designer jeans, education, freedom, all of that. Um, um, and then, what did I return to this person? I would say. Um, Helping the family, you know, with Korean families, it's it's a big deal for Korean uh, for the kids to 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 help with the family, and it's like the money the money is all kind of like in the pot that we all share, and it's very uh, tribal in that way. Uh, and so, what did I return is uh, helping my parents, you know, uh, with businesses and and work and all of that. Um, and then, what trouble did I cause this person? I think um, not being appreciative of um, all the hard work and and uh, you know how much they did to come here, and especially in the '70s with uh, racism and all that, um, and just taking things for granted, like you know mm -hmm. them buying me things and all of that. How do you feel right now? Uh, it makes me it makes me really uh, appreciative of my life today uh because you know they work for them was just like uh labor you know 16 17 hours a day is uh cooking or pulling phone cables so uh because i i don't my work is not labor it makes me appreciative of that um and also uh just me being here if it wasn't mm. for for them coming here you know with um the 500 dollars and the suitcase and and a dream um I would, I don't know. I don't know where I would be or what I would be doing, but I, I, I wouldn't uh, have the, the privilege of, of being in America. Did you experience any level of softening as you went through the exercise? Sure. Uh, softening in thinking about my parents and, and because usually when I think about my parents, I go to, um, you know, low EQ, um, not a lot of hugs, not a lot of emotional milk or I love yous, you know, uh, like my uh, quote unquote American friends had growing up. Um, but thinking about it this way makes me appreciative of um, all the, the good stuff, you know, the, the hard work, uh, the courage to come here, um, you know, buying me things like skateboards and designer jeans and stuff that I, I wanted so I could fit in, like all of that. That's really beautiful. And, you know, as I'm listening to you talk, I'm smiling. And because you're painting a, a picture with your words and your story. Um, and it, it, it you gave us just this beautiful description of gratitude. Yes. And I need to practice it often. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. Yes. So guys, um, 
it's important to tell you that so this year we just closed our last cohort for the catalyst intensive and we're going to be starting up again in january 2020 with our first cohort of the new year so if you love this science if you are a regular listener if you've been thinking about becoming a coach and you would like to join john and i in gratitude for the work that we do please take the time to speak with me about the program before the year ends. If you don't make a change in your life, you're going to stay in the same place. Yes, absolutely. And know that as you embark on a, uh, a, a career of helping other people, that process in itself is going to produce gratitude because of all the amazing stories you're going to help people with. Yes, your story causes ripples and your clients cause ripples as they become better at spreading joy in the world as well. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, guys. Keep practicing gratitude and hopefully we'll see you in class. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to Everything Life Coaching. If you're feeling the draw to become a coach, head to journey.co slash everything to explore a new career that brings fulfillment, gives you a true sense of purpose and a strong community to do it in. We created Journey Coaching to equip you with the tools, training and community you need to attain your goals. Join Journey Coaching and begin your journey towards personal freedom and a transformative state of growth today. That's jrni.co slash everything.